Hello, everyone, and welcome to Optimizing Audit Technology Perspectives from the C-Suite webinar. My name is Beverly, and I will be your moderator for this event. Today's webinar topic presents the C-level perspective on what is needed to make a world-class audit function and the importance of using audit technology. I'm joined today by two expert guest speakers, Mr. Michael P. Kanjemi and Mr. Brian Element. And I'll give you a little bit of a background on our speakers. Michael Kanjemi, a former CFO and CEO, is a prolific writer, active speaker, and senior advisor who focuses on providing continuous auditing, monitoring, and analytic intelligence for GRC, finance, and business process improvement. Michael is a senior fellow at Rutgers University and serves on the Rutgers Continuous Auditing and Reporting Lab Advisory Board. He also serves on FEI's Committee on Finance and IT and their GRC subcommittee, and the EDPAC's Editorial Advisory Board. He has written and published research papers and articles on auditing and is the co-author of the Managing the Audit Function book, The Definitive Guide on Reshaping Audit in the 21st Century. And Michael is joined by Brian Element, who brings over 30 years of experience in finance, internal audit, assurance, and advisory services to his role as an industry strategist here at Case or Idea. He is a former financial advisor to the Public Services and Procurement at the Government of Canada, and where he used data analytics extensively in internal and external audits, internal control testing, and special exams. For the past 17 years, Brian has been an IDEA trainer and was instrumental in developing resources for data analytic users, including the development of the IDEA support site, ideascripting.com. Now, before I turn over the webinar to our presenters, I will very quickly go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, everyone on the webinar has been muted. If you have any questions, you can type them into the question box on the webinar panel that appears on your screen. And the slides and video from this webinar will be made available to all attendees following the presentation. So Michael, that's it for me and the housekeeping items, I'll turn over the presentation to you. Thank you very much, Beverly and Caseware for organizing this event. And welcome everyone to Optimizing Audit Technologies, Perspectives from the C-Suite. I apologize for my voice. I uh, have had a little problem with allergies earlier this week. It seems to be clearing up, but maybe a little bit deeper than normal. Today's session will have four bit basic segments to it. Uh, first of all, we'll discuss the elements of a successful internal audit function. Um, and, and I'll give you my perspectives based on my serving as a chief audit executive and then moving on to other senior management roles. Uh, also cover how technology played an important part in making my internal audit function successful and uh, why I think it's extremely important today, even more important than when I was uh, running a, an audit department. Um, we will uh, get Brian's perspectives on that as well and move on to interfacing with the C-suite. Uh, perhaps I can share some of my uh, experiences and techniques that worked for me in my career. Um, and we end off talking about reporting, which is a major element of uh, internal audit. Uh, I'll be discussing internal audit department reporting, and Brian will uh, present some interesting uh, techniques and modern uh, uh, automated uh, means of making your reports even more valuable. Okay, so let's uh, jump right into it. Um, I enjoyed my years as a chief audit executive extremely uh, well, I, uh, my wife called it the best uh, job I ever had, uh, and I think it was. It was a great learning experience. Uh, just to put it in perspective, I was the CAE for four years of a Fortune 500 company and then had administrative responsibility for another four years for that same audit function uh, while my uh, responsibilities expanded. Basically, I, I view myself, uh, I know myself pretty well at this point. Uh, my, my joy in life is business in general, uh, seeing a business grow uh, or a function be successful within the business. Um, so uh, pass along my management philosophy, most of which came from uh, reading a lot about Peter Drucker's management theories. And um, he asked the question, if we had more time and were in an interactive mode, what's the purpose of a business Typically, people say things like making a profit, uh, creating jobs. 
uh, Peter's uh, definition is satisfying some customer need. Uh, if you satisfy a customer need, you can get revenue and the rest comes from there. Um, internal audit, uh, in my opinion, needs to have a, a, a very respected methodology, which I'll discuss uh, in greater detail. Um, create ways to contribute to the business and to the management team. So uh, I viewed myself, uh, and this is early decades ago, as part of the management team, and I'll get into the independence question versus being part of it, but I think the clear answer is if you're an internal audit, you're part of the management of the company, even though you do need to maintain an independent point of view. At a very high level summary, what made my internal audit department successful was good people, I probably should say that three times, good people, good people, uh, like real estate, real estate, real estate, but we followed a very well thought out procedure uh, or approach to auditing, which I'll explain. And we tried to be very focused on significant issues and positive deliverables. And we did a lot of implementation of technology for efficiency and effectiveness. Um, all of this wound up being lucky for me because we documented everything. I was able to uh, publish that um, in a book called Managing the Audit Function, which Beverly mentioned. And um, <clears throat> I'll explain later why I think we were a world-class audit function. Uh, maybe, maybe briefly right here. What, what sold me on the idea of being able to say that, sounds egotistical, was the fact that my board, and specifically my audit committee, asked me and my team to go to other audit committee, or other board, uh, I'm sorry, other companies where they served on the audit committee and discuss our methodology since they thought it was a very effective one. Um, so that doesn't necessarily uh, make me an auditable uh, world-class audit function, but we thought it was pretty good and the book, book has been pretty successful and translated into Chinese and another language. So basically though, to break it down to the basics of it, um, I think that the people in the audit department are extremely valuable. I'll cover that in a little more detail. Uh, and when how you do it and how you report it, of course, is uh, critical. That's the operational capability of the department. So when I first uh, joined uh, from public accounting, I compared the audit standards of public accounting to the Institute of Internal Auditing standards, and they were they were very close. Um, and um, there was a lot of latitude in how you can develop your charter for internal audit. So I chose to create a broad charter and a mission statement and to build in the fact that we would be contributing to the company uh, right into our charter and that we would document everything we were doing in an internal audit procedures manual so that we had transparency and consistency. There would be less mystery to what internal audit was all about. And just, just a footnote, the, um, the standards were completely uh, similar except for the fact that the internal audit at that time was required to have a quality assurance program even before public accounting did that. So we built that in as well. The, the elements that I built into the book and we built into our program include a very detailed planning process to make sure we were doing the right things uh, and you know risk-based uh, audit uh, universe and working from that and how we did our audits in terms of notifying uh, auditees and and uh, how we uh, produced reports and whatnot was mentioned in the audit performance process. And if I were building it today, I would be including an automated continuous monitoring process uh, section to this whole elements of a world-class audit department. And we, we focus extremely um, a, 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 a lot uh, on uh, how we did our reporting, uh, viewing our reporting as an additional product in addition uh, to people. Interesting, I was at a major uh, tech company in Silicon Valley in the last year, and their chief internal audit department presented a very similar uh, presentation and how he uh, created a well-structured internal audit uh, process, including a planning process, performance process, and he included automated continuous monitoring processes as well and ended up with the reporting process too. So <clears throat> I, I surely believe that that's been the evolution that's happened since I actually was a chief audit executive. So if you're looking at the uh, internal audit business, uh, the biggest part of the budget is people. I mean, the travel comes in very quickly 
but salaries and people are really uh, a, the critical element in my opinion. And what can make you different in my opinion is to consider the people as a product, uh, to, to loop back into uh, Peter Drucker's theory. Uh, and, and people doing a good job, uh, the better they are, the better the work that will flow from them. So uh, we considered uh, people an extremely important part of the whole process, such to the point that in trying to figure out how to make that an even more obvious positive deliverable to the company, we created a management development program along with HR and finance that <clears throat> allowed uh, us to hire people into internal audit. And, and uh, we, we did at that time have, uh, start hiring different skill sets in addition to accountants but basically it was accountants and auditors. And if we had the, uh, to do it again today, we'd be looking for the IT degrees and uh, certainly the data analytics background. And we um, built um, career paths for them outside of audit eventually. Now some stayed a very long time, some stayed short times. Uh, we can't go into all those details, um, but uh, people uh, making my people better was clearly a way to uh, make an impact on the company that was considered uh, more positive. So <clears throat> how do you affect this? I mean, how do you implement what I'm saying is a good concept? We created a, a coordinator of personnel and education position. It was a person that was also an audit manager, but they had this administrative responsibility. To give you a parallel example, um, we had a coordinator of quality assurance person also was an audit manager and uh, also fulfilled that administrative role in addition. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we, built, uh, we, we built a lot of questionnaires. Well, not a lot. When we, when we hired people, we were very specifically looking for certain types of people. I'll give you an example. Uh, and then we followed up each year uh, asking people what it was that they were interested in so we can help uh, with, their, um, with their career progression. Um, the example I give is when back when we were asking about people's technology background, uh, to make it quick, the only bad answer was if you had no interest at all in technology. It was okay to tell us you didn't know everything about technology, but, you had, but we were looking for people that had an interest because we knew we could teach them and we knew technology was going to continue to mushroom and, and uh, expand. And, and it certainly has even more than I ever anticipated. Internal audit departments spend money on training more than most uh, functions in a company, other than IT, which is kind of in a similar mode. So we built a training model that was built, you know, we, we had a graphic that looked like public accounting firms, what you can do in year one, two, uh, and then year three to five and five to seven. So we could use it as a recruiting tool and also to, again, build a a, 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 a foundation of a good internal audit department on our people. And we also used it as a marketing tool. I can't go into more detail here, but we did keep personnel files. We kept all this information. The coordinator of personnel and education uh, looked at all the evaluations, tried to figure out what skill sets people needed. And, and you can surmise the rest of it from that description, I think. <clears throat> I love this quote, the, the, the conventional definition of the management of getting work done uh, through people. But in my view, I've always liked this. Real management is developing people through the work, especially if you're in a service business like internal audit. Um, very quickly, I, well, I, I, was, I was looped into IT audit a long time ago and sent for some basic training. But my background is basically finance. Uh, I say I'm a business junkie, but my basic skill sets are in finance. Um, I did learn a lot about technology along the way, and I have a passion to continue to learn and to understand it. Um, so now that I moved on to being uh, in the C-suite, right, and uh, serving on boards, this, this element is just exactly the same for every level of management, every, even operations management, every part of every business. Right now, uh, everybody, all management people want to learn about how to use advancing technologies. I mean, you, you've got this handed to you on a silver platter right now. Um, why doesn't it happen as, uh, as quickly or as in-depth as we would like in internal audit? And the reason I, I say it's not happening enough 
is because in uh, 2015, the internal, uh, Institute of Internal Auditors hired me to um, study the information that came back uh, from their common body of knowledge study <clears throat> on how internal audit departments were using technology. And we found that the results were getting better, but in order to present a positive picture, we actually had to compare 2015 to 2005 to show that more technology was being used. But, and you can go look up some of my articles on that study or read the study, it's available um, from the IIA um, uh, on their website. It's, it's called Internal Auditors, Use of Technology. So <clears throat> I, I can't go any deeper into that, but why is internal audit taking up technology slower? Uh, part of it is because many of us are accountants and auditors first. Um, so it's not our natural expertise. Now that's getting better every day and people you hire uh, know have way more technology skills than they did back when I was in audit. It's difficult to get approval and buy-ins for capital investments. I'm going to talk about that towards the end of this session again, so I'm not going to go any deeper into it here, but if you have, if it's going through your mind that you've been turned down for money, stay to the end because I'm going to tell you what you have to do to get it. Um, there's other priorities. You have to work through them. Uh, there's different skill sets needed. Uh, not all IT projects work out as easily, and there are more risks involved than auditing other people's business. Uh, but to add value to the business, there's clearly a need to expand the use of technology. This is a core requirement of COSO. But COSO doesn't say that it's only to improve internal control. Um, well, we have a spelling typo in there. That's interesting. But uh, sorry for that. The, there's an opportunity with your job responsibility to improve internal control, to build controls in and expand beyond that to improve business processes in a company. So <clears throat> I think that's a major focus, and I'm going to have a couple of slides on that. You can expand the use of technology in order independently, or you can do projects with other parts of the company, or encouraging or laying out a plan for other parts of the company to improve their use of technology. Two, two surveys come together for me here in this recommendation. I, I like to talk about business process improvement because it's, it, it encompasses to me internal control improvement as well. So when we did the common body of, well, when the Institute designed their common body of knowledge survey, they asked what the function was of internal audit. And most um, respondents said that, and this is asking CAEs, I think there was 14,000 people surveyed, uh, internal auditors surveyed. And they said the number one job that they had was improving the internal control in a company. And I don't quarrel with that. That's an important, um, that's an important function. <clears throat> but as you're doing it, you can, uh, improve business processes. In the view of the chief audit executives, improving business process did not even get mentioned until way down the list. Now, if you look at C-suite surveys, um, technology-driven business process improvements is exactly what they're looking for in all aspects of the company, including uh, the uh, internal audit department. I have seen many examples of joint projects uh, between operations and internal audit, which has made the internal audit department look like superstars for just being involved in it. So what do you do next? Um, I think you look for ways, and Brian's gonna cover some of this as well, for you to add automated processes to improve um, the internal audit function itself. Uh, you can select and implement independent monitoring, bring in new technologies, but you can also recommend the use of technologies by management for business process improvements as you go along uh, <clears throat> where you see those opportunities. So learning yourself, for example, how to use data analytics will be another skill set that you bring to auditing other functions and, <clears throat> and where you can then recommend they do it. But I'm also going to suggest that it's not a bad idea to partner with them and actually doing the projects. And I've seen this happen at IBM, internal audit, um, and other uh, major companies. It's 
Um, it's got the independence questions which some of you are uh, thinking about right now, but it doesn't remove your independence to participate in a project. So <clears throat> overcoming the obstacles uh, that I mentioned before, uh, I said I would come back and talk about that. If you go and ask for uh, capital or an expense and get turned down, uh, that's part of the process. Um, as a CFO, I think people considered me Dr. No. Um, you always say no uh, when people ask for capital. Uh, I had a retail division. They would come and ask for capital to build 10 new stores, and they knew emphatically every one of them would be successful. And we knew at the board level, not every one of them would be successful. So you start off by making people prove their, uh, their point. And um, that, um, I mean, you just have to build that into your uh, planning and approach. Don't give up. Uh, tenacity uh, will win the day. Um, other priorities. You need to make this a priority. Um, I, I've heard, I hear from too many internal orders or we just don't have time to do it. I don't think you really have an option anymore with um, expanding the use of technology. Um, I, I hear, I don't know how to do it. Uh, well, that's, that's okay, um, but you need to develop the skills. And one of the things I often recommend is, that, and I'm not talking just internal audit. I was a CIO at one point in my life, and we had to implement technology in various parts of the company. There's a pretty high failure rate, and projects don't always go easily. But um, working with good software vendors is usually a great place to start. They know how to do it. And, and if you uh, work with good vendors, that's a good, uh, that, that increases your chance of being successful. But uh, it also involves some skills you're not necessarily always using in internal audit. Creative skills, vision, and the ability to take risks. You read all the quotes about people falling down, getting back up, and um, if you have projects that run into trouble, you're going to be working for managers in your business that have had that happen to them. It's not, um, it's not a unique experience to have difficulties with projects. It's, it's how you build your skills to work your, work, work your way through it. So success is derived by adding value to the business. You can do that through business process improvements. Um, you can, uh, look to the finance departments right now where on my committee at FEI, every quarter I go to meetings where I hear from companies like Johnson & Johnson, Nike, big companies, all putting in hundreds of robotic process automation functions in their accounting and finance function. They face the same risks. Some of them don't work perfectly the first time, um, but they have experienced the efficiency and effectiveness. And um, I'm going to be able to rest my voice here for a minute. I'm going to be turning uh, over uh, the screen to um, Brian now, who's going to give you a little bit uh, more depth on how to automate some of the work that you're doing and, and um, make it, um, make it, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm clicking to do the transition. Um, so let me, let me hand it over to Brian. And he'll take the company. You go, Brian. Okay. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Uh, so thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, so just a bit of background on myself. One sec. Just a bit of background on myself. As Bev mentioned, I currently work as an industry strategist with Caseware. Uh, I'm a very recent addition to the Caseware team. Actually, I've only been here for about a month. Uh, previously to me joining Caseware, I've over 30 years working in both external and internal audit, along with working internal controls and financial data and analytics. So over the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is bring you some of the things I've learned during my 30 years. I'd first like you to start thinking, if you're not already doing it, about using data analytics during all the phases of the audit process namely the planning, performing, the field work, during the reporting, and finally the follow-up. During the planning phase, I would recommend segmenting your population in different ways in order to see where your high-risk transactions are, such as by location and transaction type. 
This is especially important when you have a large decentralized organization, and I've worked in a few of those. Think about different ways to group your information, such as performing summaries or pivot tables by location or sector in order to see where your risks actually are. Doing this assumes you've already defined which type of transactions are risky based on your business profile. By segmenting your population, you can then plan on where to use your limited resources to best cover off the risks in your organization. When doing this, you can think outside the box, maybe use a dashboard or mapping technology. This is an example of using a map to show where your transactions are located. I worked in one organization that had offices all over the world. What we would do is define where our risks are and map them out and create a three-year plan so that we would cover off all the high-risk regions at least once every three years. Using these type of maps, you can easily see your risks and the value of that region. At the fieldwork phase, this is usually the area that most people think about using data analytics. At this stage, usually the biggest challenge is obtaining the proper data for your audit. One thing you always must remember, and I'll mention this a few times, is that you want to always make sure that the data is properly reconciled. You don't want to start working on a project using incomplete or incorrect data. Also think about the audit you're performing. Most software platforms now have data analytics tests that have already been created for the area you're looking on. So instead of reinventing the wheel, use these tests and spend your time thinking of other things you can perform that might be unique to your business. When developing new data analytics, make sure that you have the expertise to perform the work. As I mentioned in the previous slide, obtaining access to the data can be quite difficult. You need to identify the data required. Quite often it's better to get all the data instead of only taking a portion of it. It is easier to discard fields you don't need once you have them than to go back and ask for more information. Depending on the type of data, you may need the support of IT to obtain it. And like I said before, before starting any work, make sure the data is complete and reconciled. An example of the difficulties that can result in obtaining the data, uh, I previously worked in finance in a, on a data analytics team. A lot of our analysis was based on our SAP system. We had internal programs that allowed us to dump the different financial tables directly. IT, who controlled the security of SAP, gave me access to use the codes. That, was actually, that actually took a few months to get but refused to give me access to the area where the files were stored. So each time I did a download, I had to open up a ticket to get the information copied over to where I could access it. And depending on uh, the help desk, the number of requests the help desk have, it could take up to a week to actually get that information. It took about six months of going around before I was fi able to finally get direct access to these files. And this was even after our own SAP team said there was no risk in me having access to it. It was IT that kept pushing back. So you can see sometimes, even in the same organization, it can be difficult to obtain the proper data. Here's an example of a canned data analytics for accounts payable. I think pretty much all data analytics platforms now have some type of canned routines that you can use to save time. Unfortunately, depending on your audit, canned data analytics routines may not exist. In this case, you'll have to build the routine yourself. You need to make sure that you have the expertise in the area you are auditing. Sometimes you'll need to hold brainstorming sessions to find the areas that are problematic and figure out what types of routines are needed to validate this area. When I was working in an internal audit, we had hired some consultants to look at a program. They decided to probe data, sorry, they decided to perform data analytics on the area, and it was a good one to use DA on. Once they had completed, they gave us a large list of exceptions. So we started, started looking at all the exceptions and we soon figured out that the consultants had not done a proper validation and, re, re, and really learned about the program. They performed the data analytics on how they thought it should work instead of actually learning how it actually worked. So we had hundreds of false hits and the DA was basically useless to us because of the lack of learning the program from the experts within our organization. As I mentioned in the previous slide, you want to make sure you have the necessary expertise and you want to make sure if you're using junior staff that are properly supervised. Another example from my internal audit days was a junior auditor who was given the task of looking at procurement cards. The person had come from that area, so they had the expertise in order to know what to look for. The audit was supposed to be representative of the entire population. Unfortunately, as the, audit, the auditor was relatively new, 
they figured out the proper sample size, but instead of picking a random sample so that it would be representative of the population, they instead did judgmental sampling, and as they knew how the program worked, they picked items that appeared to be suspicious, and as such, they had a huge error rate. Of course, they thought it was a great work. Unfortunately, it was not representative of the population, and we had to redo the audit. Oops. All right, there we go, skip one, okay. Uh, after you've completed your field work and had it validated, you may want to consider turning it into a continuous auditing program or monitoring. A continuous auditing program would be one that audit would run, while if you hand it over to the client, that would turn into a monitoring program that you could then review to make sure it's working. Generally, I think it's better to, if the client does the continuous monitoring as they are in a position to be proactive and fix the problems that come up on a timely basis. Also, continuous does not mean that it's continually being performed in real time, which it might be, but usually it's something that you would run on a weekly, monthly, or quarterly basis. Usually the riskier the area, the more often you want to run it. As you will be doing this on a regular basis, this is something that you should, should be automated. Most data analytics software have some type of scripting language that can be used to automate the process. Higher end software can even have workflows that allow you to send out automated emails for problems and depending on the severity, different people may receive the email. Here's an example of a scripting language that I regularly use. If anyone has created macros in Excel, this should look familiar as it uses the same language. Having a language like this allows you to do a lot with the automation of your projects and makes projects quite reusable. Most data analytics software are now following access to automation in higher level, uh, allowing access to automation in higher level languages, such as Python and R. This is an example of using Python in one of the packages I have regularly used. Allowing access to these higher level languages, especially Python and R, allows the auditor to create potentially very robust data analytics as these languages have a wealth of functionality that can be used in data analytics. Python has a large number of modules that can be used when looking at any type of data analysis. Did you know using the data analytics you can win awards? Here's a picture of myself. I'll let you figure out which one's me. Uh, winning an award recently for work I did using data analytics software. Of course, the rest of the team had a huge part of it in it also. The award was for proactive disclosure. Within the Canadian government, all contracts over 10,000 must be posted to the internet on a quarterly basis. Because of the very short time frame, the team usually has a week to perform the review and cleanup of these contracts. The department I was working in at the time has thousands of new contracts in the quarter and is the procurement arm of the government. Previously, the cleanup was being done using Excel and it would take at least three days in order to review all the information and this is only one pass. I use data analytics software to speed up uh, the performance. So that was performed over five minutes, allowing for, for, sorry, allowing for reports to be generated and reviewed and corrections made and then redoing the entire process. The entire process was built using four different scripts for different stages of the process. The first script did the import of the file and some basic housekeeping. The second part was the most important and as it was the quality assurance. This could be run several times during each session. Once the uh, project team was satisfied with the quality of the data, analysis script was run that created different tables and graphs for management review. And the final script was to take the information and turn it into a management report. Uh, so the, here, this is just part two of the proactive disclosure, just showing how I created different dialogues to allow the information to be easily imported in. And as I said, in this project, the QA script was the most important and it contained 48 tests that made sure the contract information was of a high quality. So now I'm gonna give it back to Michael. Oh, there you go, Michael. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Brian obviously has a lot more detailed knowledge of actually implementing the technology uh, himself and more recently. Uh, I like what, what when he says um, continuous is not always continuous. Um, it, it reminds me of uh, in 
for the last 10 years or so, I've been focused on continuous monitoring use of analytics, um, sort of in my semi-retirement year. And my initial idea was everything was going to be continuous, and it didn't take me long to figure out that continuous didn't always have to be continuous. It could be periodic. Um, and um, it, <clears throat> it um, certainly has, has uh, become broadly accepted now that that's the way it goes. So um, I said uh, I moved uh, from um, the uh, chief audit position, uh, chief audit executive position. My first stop was actually CIO. and um, and I, I had a portfolio in the company at that point in time, including all of technology and um, um, other functions like benefits, payroll, and uh, other functions within finance. Um, and I also had the administrative report, reporting responsibility from the new chief audit executive. Um, well, the next step after that for me was to become a CFO. And um, uh, that was my dream from my uh, early days in business. I, I wanted to be um, a CFO. That was my goal in life. Um, I thought if I could get there, I'd be happy uh, figuring out, you know, leases and where the business would be and how business served our customers. And I was a very broad, uh, broadly focused CFO. Uh, uh, accounting and keeping score was very important. And uh, I think I was really good at that but um, I also wanted to build a business. So um, I developed this philosophy that when people uh, came to me for capital expenditures or uh, new functions within the company, uh, they, had to, uh, they had to address showing me how they would either increase revenue or lower cost. And it's not quite that simple. Um, improving the customer experience can lead to more sales, uh, so that was uh, uh, one way to do it. Uh, my technology projects that I had to improve approve during my career, uh, they were expensive as I, and, as I said, risky. But typically, once they worked, they reduced our cost and improved either our customer experience or our operations, which ultimately you know, got the product to the customer more efficiently. Um, and we were always interested in improving internal controls because as a CFO, you're scared to death that the numbers might not be right, or you might be missing something. Um, you want to also reduce your fraud costs and take less of a brand risk. So uh, money needed to be allocated to that. But again, as I blended in in the beginning of this session, uh, we really looked for them to do internal control improvements as well as business process uh, improvements. By the way, on the fraud costs, I have some friends that are really deep into audit risk and deep into fraud and the fraud association talking about how fraud could be 5% of sales of a company. I don't know how that, that number always seemed very large to me, but there was never any question in my mind that you have leakage everywhere in the company and that uh, reducing uh, the risk of fraud and improving controls was certainly a way to add efficiency or to put it in my simplistic model here to to lower your cost. Um, now I got to serve as a chief uh, as a um, audit committee chair uh, and and that was interesting uh, and I could tell you from that experience that that's a difficult job first of all and um, uh, the, the people that get to do it now uh, it's even more complicated and more complex uh, certainly with uh, IT security and, and cyber interventions and all of that. Um, so it's a challenging job and they really, really will appreciate having an internal audit function that's looking out into the into new areas. I think uh, the, the, the risks that some chief audit executives are afraid of are mitigated by the contribution level that you could uh, that you can bring to the company. So um, I'm encouraging you to to, to uh, expand your horizons on what you think the internal audit department can do. Um, both of these, every level of senior management, as I said before, want uh, expanded use of technology for efficiency, effectiveness, control improvement, call it whatever you want. So how do you deal with these people in the C-suite? Um, before you get there, you know, you really don't know exactly what the, what the what's going on in their heads, except that uh, they, they, they're responsible for a broad uh, a broad uh, brush of the business, not just one function. 
Um, so what I did was I, 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 I studied them. Uh, I tried to uh, spend more time with them. A uh, good example for me would be the, the vice president of finance. I was an accountant by trade, CPA, uh, learned a lot about technology. I was not a banking expert. Uh, interfacing with bankers, borrowing money, was all, all skills that I had to learn actually as a CFO. So when I was involved with audit, I, I, uh, I focused on trying to understand what each one of these people's jobs were, both sides of it. Uh, I didn't want to just review their work and try to criticize it. I wanted to figure out how to help them actually get it done. Um, you could look for mentors in the company. Some people like myself are very interested if you're interested in talking about what's going on with the business, what's going on with my aspect of the business. And I think it's a good idea to take on uh, professional association jobs like uh, being involved with ISACA uh, and um, other, um, the IIA and other organizations that work for me. Um, I, I became a chapter president for ISACA a long time ago. Um, and what did I get from that? Uh, I got to be a little bit closer with the speakers and the people that were writing for us um, and attending more sessions. Uh, it also helped me with credibility with my senior management mentors that I was trying to work with. Um, they knew I was uh, stretching myself and running a, a chapter and eventually I became international president of ISAC and ran the whole organization. What a great learning experience it was for me. Um, <clears throat> growing professionally, uh, I started, uh, when I was in high school, I had a job working at Merrill Lynch and I started reading the Wall Street Journal and it's the first thing I do every day today. Uh, I want to understand what's going on and when I was at any part of my career, I was reading and reading industry publications and um, at least one business journal uh, uh, and, and industry uh, journals. and. You have the opportunity to read some of my thoughts on things like the Caseware blog, so you can add that to the list. It's not just me that's suggesting that there's a great opportunity here to extend uh, your value as internal auditors in the company. There's a quote from Brian, uh, from Brennan Bayback, who's now the chair of the ISAC, of ISACA, but also he's at Oracle, a company that uh, has uh, a, a big uh, uh, technology base. So they can imagine what they expect from their internal auditors. So he's saying basically what I said, all enterprises are exploring uh, the digital transformation and IT orders must do the same to, to ensure that they're valued partners by the organization. This was a quote from a, a blog he wrote last year. So it's very up to date. So get, getting back to making how we can make your audit department different. We talked about personnel. Uh, and here's just a smorgasbord of other things you could do. Uh, we jumped on M&A, you know, mergers and acquisitions, disposition audits, anything we can do uh, to, you know, where we would drive in the business one direction or another, where the company was driving the business, and we could get on that train. Uh, we looked at contract audits. We made a lot of uh, recoveries uh, in co contract audit work and got some pretty good um, credit for that. Um, we would ask to be involved in shareholder Q&A book preparation. Uh, we worked on the standards for corporate conduct. We said we would be a great group since we're independent to collect the, uh, 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 the confirmation of compliance with, uh, with the company's ethical standards. Um, then we work with the legal department on, uh, on you know, resolution of them and follow up. So we talked already about personnel development. I, I uh, promoted people, found ways to make that uh, a big plus for our department. Uh, we work with the external orders. Um, they, you know, they have challenges at their rates where they can't go deeper into things. Uh, we sometimes took advantage of that by going deeper. Um, I, I believe in marketing. I can't go into this detail because we're coming up on time, uh, but I have a chapter in my book on marketing the audit function, getting the message out, and certainly reporting is one of the one of the products of internal audit and can be a key deliverable. That's sort of like a marketing item, right? Because it's a report that's going to go into people's hands. Um, what could you do to make your reports better? Well, first of all, quality recommendations and findings, um, and that you know that, that's the 
the basics of audit, and I gave you my tip there, get good people, have them following structured uh, uh, approaches, and um, <clears throat> it'll work for you. Now, in terms of the reporting itself, we decided to break down our audiences. So we had brief summary reports where we put a banner across the top, gave it a color. It was a one-page report, two sides of the page, that we got a lot of readership out of that. That was supported by detail reports. And of course, today, now you can use automated reporting, much of which Brian will go into. In, your, in our reports to management, we discussed budgets in detail, how we spent the money to show we were uh, conscientious about that. Uh, we discussed upfront whether we delayed an audit or uh, expanded an audit. Um, we audited ourselves, and I said earlier we had the quality assurance coordinator. That gave us a huge amount of credibility, and we reported on the results of that program. Then we took the reports to management and flowed them down to a more concise report to the audit committee. Um, we gave negative assurance, as far as we know. Uh, internal control systems were operating effectively. Um, we discussed the level of cooperation, which gave us a lot of leverage with management if they didn't. Um, and then we listed our reports, our quality assurance. Uh, how we expand the new technology would be a separate pr presentation. Um, <clears throat> and at this point, um, I, I'll uh, turn it back over to Brian to bring us home. Um, give me one minute. Again, I apologize about my about my my voice here. There you go, Brian. Okay, thanks. There we go. Okay, thanks, Michael. So when you get to the reporting phase, you need to take your data analytics and make it speak to the users of the report, such as management or the audit committee. There are different ways you can do this, such as rolling your analysts into summary information. You don't want to overwhelm the users with too many details, but keep it at a level that the information is easily understandable while being able to have the details if needed. Generally, at this stage, you want to assess your against your data analytics objectives. You want to make sure that you are going to report align. Sorry, that you are going to report aligns with the project. The information should allow the user to easily understand what was found and support the findings of your report. In the past, most reports use tables of information to support their findings. With current technology, it is quite easy to transform your analysis into something that is more visual and conveys your findings in an easy format. Most analytics software now have dashboarding options, and there are several well-known software packages that specialize in dashboarding. The reason you might want to use a dashboard is that a picture is really worth a thousand words in, in this instance. Using visuals will allow any person looking at the result to easily understand what is going on. Just think that a report on paper uses static data, while with a dashboard you can use live data so that it's always current. Also creating these types of dashboards can be handed over to management so that they can better perform monitoring in that area. I found these good suggestions to think about when creating a dashboard. You should consider your end goal, so think of what you want to present and how you want to get it across to the users of the dashboard. You shouldn't want to place all the information on the same dashboard. Consider grouping similar findings on this dashboard page. You should make sure that the dashboard does not become messy and make sure that it is relevant and easy to understand. When choosing a layout, choose one carefully. Remember, you are trying to convey your findings to users that might not have the time to take to understand a complex dashboard. Keep it as simple as possible. Be careful with colors. Select a color scheme and stick with it. Also, flashy is not always better. The tools now have dozens of different charts. When creating a dashboard, make sure you select the proper chart for the information. If you have to take time to explain what the chart says, then maybe you did not select the proper chart. Be consistent with your formatting. Don't mix different formats in the same dashboard. Allow for drill downs. Most software will allow you to drill down to, into the underlying data. This is great if you have a hands-on management that want to explore the data and see the transactions that are causing the underlying problems. Having this functionality will greatly increase the user's experience, especially if the dashboard is ultimately used by management for monitoring purposes. Here's an example of a simple dashboard. At the top, it has different stats that could be used to, sorry, that could be of use to the user of the dashboard. 
Usually the auditor would place stats that would be of interest or highlight anomalies. In the bottom, you have four different charts that show off different types of analysis relating to your work. It is best to pick the charts wisely that support the audit. Here's an example of a drill down functionality. In this case, I selected one of the bars in the previous slide and it brought me to the underlying data that supports the information. <coughs> Excuse me. Having this functionality allows anyone that is interested in looking at the underlying data to easily access it. Here's an example of being able to show only one chart in more detail. Also, you can see that there are different chart types that can be used. So generally, it's a good idea to experiment to see which chart type best fits the information. Here's a bit more advanced dashboard. This one is showing some general information on the audit status, such as the status by month and the breakdown of what state the different audits are at. It also has a breakdown by manager and by region, along with showing some interesting information using Benford's analysis. This is a good example of a high-level dashboard that shows the current status of the different audits. It doesn't get into the details of any one audit, but gives you a good overview. Just some thoughts on what you might want to look for in a data analytics software. Namely, depending on the size of your organization, you should make sure it's able to handle the number of transactions within your financial system and that it can handle any future growth. You don't want a tool that works now but will stop working in a few years because your organization has grown and your tool can no longer handle the data load. You want to make sure that the tool has the basic tests and functions that you need for your audits or with many data analytics tools that you can obtain the test to add onto the functions of the software. It should have some way to automate its works. Most have some type of scripting language, but you want to make sure that the language is not static and that can handle the changes within the audit industry. An example is having something that can use Python as the language. As Python is being continually updated and has a huge number of modules that can be accessed, having your tool be able to use something as powerful as Python or R would be a plus. As your auditors, you want to make sure that your steps in performing your analysis have been documented. When having to explain your findings, you don't want to use a software that is a black box where you put your information in, it gives you the results, but doesn't tell you how it obtained these results. You should have a good history of all the steps for review and placement in your audit files as support for your analysis. Allowing users to easily rerun the analysis is essential. This can be done through scripts or through rerunning the history. Now I'm going to return the presentation to Michael for the wrap up and summary. Uh, one second. Uh, there you go, Michael. Oop, okay. A little too quick. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, Brian, thank you very much for uh, really expanding on uh, the modern day approach to audit reporting. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't do that job today myself. So it shows you what a manager is using the right people for the right tools for the right uh, presentation. Uh, just a quick summary so we can leave time for Q and A. Uh, we already talked about it. So um, building the elements of a world class audit function. Take a look at uh, your organization first. Uh, look for ways to make uh, positive deliverables. Clearly, in this day, it's important to expand the knowledge of and use of technology and continuous monitoring. And um, partnering is okay. It's okay to work with operations. Uh, I think uh, that will work out to your benefit. Uh, try to stay in step with management. Um, hopefully, many of you will have careers that uh, take you to the most senior levels of internal audit or uh, to the most senior levels of the company itself. Uh, keep in mind that your reports are a product and um, it gives you a, a, a way to uh, uh, explain to the world what you do and, and uh, put a lot of effort into it, and I think that will pay off. And now I'll turn it over to uh, back to Beverly for uh, a wrap-up and uh, some Q&A. Thank you, Michael and Brian. Uh, that was a great presentation. I do have a few questions from the audience. Um, the first one I have is, what should we do to mitigate our lack of experience with audit technology? Okay, I'll start and I think Brian could probably chime in on this. The, um, it's a given that we're never gonna know everything about technology. Um, I, I read everything I can about it. Um, I would uh, say taking uh, like 
uh, even if you're not using a particular vendor, go to their vendor, um, vendor uh, uh, customer meetings, um, try to get training from them, uh, try to get training from uh, people like ISACA and IIA that offer the training, and don't be afraid to leap in. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that. Also, there's lots of resources out there right now. Uh, some of the resources, uh, you know, Mark Negritti has several excellent books out there. Uh, Sunderji has uh, one on fraud analytics. Uh, there's, I've noticed probably in the last five years that there's been a distinct increase in the number of books you can just go purchase on Amazon and uh, that will get you started and really ex explains how to use data analytics. And some of them are geared towards internal audit, some are more geared towards external audit, uh, but they're all great resources to check out. Great, thank you. Uh, another question I have is, what type of data is good to pull for use in data analytics? Uh, okay, I could sort of take that. It ultimately depends on what you are working on, what your audit is. If it's a financial audit, then definitely you want to be pulling off uh, sort of your main tables from your financial system, your transaction tables. Uh, you know, each system is slightly different and each audit would be slightly different depending on like if you're doing accounts payable, procurement, you know, something like that. If you're doing something else, you know, uh, there's analytics out there to do, uh, to look at the Twitter feeds to see if people are uh, happy with your company. Uh, so there's all kinds of information out there now. The problem is not lack of information, it's having too much information and actually getting uh, interesting uh, findings from it. Uh, so, but really, it really depends on your audit. You know, you got to look at your audit, you got to step back and you got to figure out, okay, what information do I need from the client, from other third party resources that will support my audit? So, Michael, you have any comments? Yeah, I, I like to talk about creativity here. So I was trained as an IT auditor a long time ago, and they asked me to go and audit and automate audits. And I was facing the same issue as Brian. It depends on what you want to audit. And so I had to walk people through what you could do. Um, and obviously now there's a lot of examples in the literature, so you can just go look at what other people are doing. But I, I think you need to just sit back and think. If you're if you're concerned about inventory obsolescence, you're going to come up with ideas like looking at inventory, uh, looking at sales versus uh, inventory on hand. And just if you don't love that part of this job, it's and that's the part of every part of business trying to figure out how to solve problems. So um, I mean, dr just drive your your brain into the data or into the elements of the issue. What would make it better for the company? and then try to figure out what data you need and what tools you need against that data. Great, thank you. Um, so another question I have is, uh, what's the best way to select tools for uh, data analytics? And what features um, should be considered? Uh, that, here again, it depends really on what type of audits you're gonna be performing. <clears throat> You got certain uh, tools that are more geared towards uh, financial auditing, uh, so they'd be the best in that instance. Uh, you got other tools that are more uh, geared towards uh, textual analytics. Uh, so there's lots of different software out there. Uh, really, what you have to do again, like in the previous question, is you got to sort of define what you're going to be using your tool for. Once you figure out what you're going to use your tool for, then you got to look around and see, okay, which tools best fit. And there's all kind of different tools out there, uh, data analytics tools out there. There's all kind of different price ranges uh, too. So uh, you got to make sure that you know it'll fit not only now but generally a tool there, especially if you go into uh, spend time and resources in automating your items. You want to make sure that whatever you choose will last you for the foreseeable future. You don't want to be creating automated scripts and everything, and then two years down the road, decide that, oh, this software no longer works for me, I have to change software. You sort of, uh, you know, wasted all your investment there. Michael? Well, um, I, I think we're pretty close to the end of time, but all right. 
I would look at it, just think of it in a broader sense. Maybe that's my role here. So when I was in the retail industry, we changed point of sale software two or three times in, in a couple of decades. And you, and you have to do what they call systems requirement definition, or you have to look at what you're trying to do, and then look at various vendors and how their software accomplishes what you're trying to do. And uh, you'll you just think you'll learn an awful lot from that, um, from that exercise. And as Brian said, you'll, you'll reduce your, your error rate a little bit. Um, but as I said earlier, these technology projects are challenging and risky. So you gotta, you gotta really put the effort in. Hard work pays off. Great, thank you. Well, we're still getting a lot of questions from the audience, uh, which is really nice to see. There's about five unanswered questions, but to respect everyone else's time, I will wrap up the webinar. Um, keep your questions coming or send them to connect at caseware.com because we will look at them and our pre presenters will answer those questions and we can send the answers out to you. <laughs> So I am going to wrap up the session. Thank you everybody for, for sticking with us. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you speakers for um, delivering a great presentation. Um, and again, for those of you um, who have asked, there will be a recording sent out to all of you for you to um, reflect on and review on your own time and that'll be sent to you by the end of the week. And again, any unanswered questions, please feel free to send them at caseware, uh, connect at caseware.com. Thank you very much for attending. Have a great day.